everyone. Hope you're well. Please have your cameras on. So tomorrow we'll have class at 12.30 p.m. IST. If uh, anything changes, we'll let you know on the channel. So that's one. Secondly, we'll have a small test today for the first 10 minutes. So if you have been, if you're absent for the last class, haven't watched the episode, don't worry. To all those who were present in the last episode, please note down one question. Explain, explain the various facets of the idealist approach to study of international relations. First talk. Comment on its contemporary relevance. 250 words, 20 marks. Explain the various facets of the idealist approach to study international relations. Comment on its contemporary relevance. So what I will do now is I'll create breakout rooms, discuss this for five minutes, and then we'll then I'll cold call you. Okay. This is whatever you know. Build an answer. See what all you can write. Should we this, uh, discuss the question? <coughs> Sorry. Would someone like to go ahead? Yeah, I could do that. So, sure. I was just wondering this various facets of the idealist approach. I think this relates to uh, what Emmanuel Kant mentioned, uh, the three ideas that he mentioned in the perpetual peace of uh, democracy, international organizations, and uh, international laws. So I would briefly define what is idealist approach and mention about its brief history, how it's it the idea is pioneered by Woodrow Wilson and Immanuel Kant. And then I would mention that the various facets of idealist approach is deep rooted in Kant's perpetual peace, um, where he mentioned about the three ideas that uh, would be 
that would play a significant role in preventing conflicts and wars one uh, democracy in nations would lead to democracy in nations are less likely to lead to clash and conflicts because uh, democratic nations uh, hold their elected elected officials accountable unlike the authoritarian leaders and i we could give the examples of uh, how the weak uh, democracies are more indulged in clashes and conflicts of uh, park as we had discussed or uh, the present uh, weakening democracy in israel and then we could elaborate on international organizations and international laws also i would like to give opportunities to others as well to speak i think we can also <clears throat> mention the assumptions that we covered in the last uh, question because those also related to uh, these question that is uh, innate uh, human nature is of um, <clears throat> sorry my throat is a little bad today so rationality it uh, fosters cooperation then second point is uh, uh, in interna <clears throat> international cooperation like the point which kundan just mentioned elaborate on that then th third was rule of law and diplomacy the role played by diplomacy in preventing wars and violence and uh, for prevailing peace then the fourth one was that nations have a mutual uh, interest or aspirations so we can uh, mention the in the eu we can mention about eu and the role played by eu in comparison to what uh, the 30 years war period so we can mention that or we can mention the various deals like paris agreement deal or the montreal protocol deals all those deals and then in the <clears throat> last we can mention uh, morgan thu's uh, argument that uh, it is all very utopian and idealistic Uh, but in reality power dynamics plays a major role or the or the emphasis on real politics real politics also can we mention about how un was able to prevent wars in contemporary relevance like we also discussed about the importance of international organizations in maintaining peace so the contemporary example could be un and uh, we also seen how the uh, r2p works so that could be could that be a contemporary relevance yes i think we can mention that that would be relevant here r2p and yeah human we can also then mention the role played by like various other international organizations like who like geneva convention all of that in the critic would be just hans morgan theo right or do we have another criticism of it as well like there is another there is another criticism but we haven't discussed it it's by kenneth waltz he says that but that that would be a different criticism of realism only so that was, i i sir hasn't discussed it yet i like that part but there are other critics as well we can mention those we did criticize idealist tra tradition but uh, my question is could we should we also criticize its contemporary relevance like one's inability to stop the war or something like that or is it uh, if you okay want to I can mention about how un is failing to prevent un israel and palestinian conflict Okay, so who is ready with the answer? Bankot, go on. Okay, so uh, I'm with you. 
the idealistic approach in international relations, which is also known as what we discussed as a liberal idealism, centers around the belief in cooperation, fairness, and shared value in creating a peaceful world. It is generated in a response to the devastated effects of World War I, which is morally deeply rooted uh, in the ideas of thinkers like Immanuel Kant and as we see in leaders like US President Woodrow Wilson. Coming to the facets of idealism, I'm thinking facets can also include assumptions which we discussed, especially peace is possible in countries if fo follow the moral law, international cooperation with shared resources and economic and political partnership. Then we have international laws, laws on how countries should behave or how countries should, how powerful uh, countries should, even if they are powerful, how they react. However, in the com in the current contemporary world, it is still relevant in the current contemporary world. As we can see in the global efforts, uh, it could be pandemic, climate change, or any other uh, World Trade Organization or any any kind of uh, organizations which are taking care globally where countries are supporting. But in general world, uh, critics like Hans Morgan Theo argue that idealistics are too optimistic. In reality, countries will generally look for power and that's how they are secure. Every country looks for its own survival. Perfect answer. This is exactly what you had to write. So good job. So UPSC will just twist a few words. This is a question that they asked this time in 2024, 23 weeks. No, 24 weeks. That's what they asked. Okay. We will give a brief story that this idealist approach in IR largely developed post World War One. What kind of a world does it envision? Ethical norms, cooperation, international institutions. And then you write key facets, more or less assumptions, but you just change that term from assumptions to becomes facets. Human nature, international institutions, rule of law and diplomacy, mutual interests, cooperation, with everything you've got to give examples. Okay, and then you give some contemporary relevance, some critiques, done. Clear? So good job, I'm so happy that uh, we're learning this skill set. At the end of the day, it's all about what you write. I know there are many institutes where you have to fill in a lot of books, but it's irrelevant if you cannot write it under 250 words. The best way to prepare for the subject is via questions and answers. I will start today's episode with a few videos. Okay. But I'll be honest. Whatever you may see could be hard for some of you to watch. But I'm not sharing this to shock you or discourage you. I'm sharing these videos so that as future leaders and thinkers, you see things as they are. You don't live in that dreamy world of our glory. It's never about basking in the comfort of our fake glory. In international relations, we have to face reality. We may have to ask ourselves some tough questions. So as you watch through these number of videos, I'll show approximately five, six videos. Think about the larger implications, your thoughts. Ask yourself, why is this happening? What is happening? What does it mean for India's image on the world stage? And how does it impact the idea of India? Okay, because I think in the IR, you have to have a lot of moral authority. And that authority develops over a substantial amount of time. Sort of quick thing. Whatever India developed in terms of goodwill took many, many years of efforts right from 1947. 
let's watch a few videos and let me know your thoughts. It turns out that there is a disturbing but entirely unsurprising trend taking place among what appears to be the international student population here in Canada. A viral Twitter post from this user showing a series of YouTube videos uploaded by Indian international students here in Canada talking about how they can get free food while studying here has been viewed more than 400,000 times and retweeted more than 1,000 times. It seems as though this Twitter post has struck a nerve. How to get free items in Canada, one video title reads. How to get free food in Canada for international students, another title reads. And how about this one, my personal favorite. Free food hamper for needy in Canada. And the thumbnail shows a mother with her child saying, I got diapers and chocolate. International students are coming to Canada to get access to our education system, paying twice the tuition fees that a Canadian-born student would pay, taking up spaces for Canadian students, and now, it appears, leeching off of the charitable initiatives of Canadians, going to food banks to essentially steal food from those who really need it most. Two things struck me, however, when I was making this video. The first being the gall of these people to make videos like this, showing them abusing a charitable system in place for Canadians is astounding. They don't even seem to have any shame at all. And the second thing that struck me was a question I asked myself. Who are these videos for? They're clearly not made for international students already here in Canada because as you will see later on in the show, they're already abusing the system. The videos clearly are to sell the idea of being an international student back home in India. They're being used as a promotion tool for more international students to come to this country and abuse the system. But are these international students really the ones to blame here? Or is it the Canadian education system working hand in hand with the government to stuff the coffers of failing colleges and universities while also creating a seemingly endless supply of cheap foreign labor? This is a story of greed and a story of abuse. Stick around to find out more. Drop a like in the video. Help us out with subscribe. Is it time to this country? Let me know in the comments and let's get into it. Take a look at this Twitter post from a user called John Carter. Immigration is extremely important to Canada's econ... Oh wait, what's this here? How to get free items in Canada by Neman Kapil? Free grocery, mattress, and blanket for international students in Canada by a one Naina Kukreja. How to get free food in Canada for international students. Food hamper by a Samar Jeet Singh. How to get free food in Canada. Food bank details. International student with family. Free food hamper for needy in Canada. Calgary food bank by one Ikra Azam. Well, it would appear as though these international students studying here in Canada have found a little trick up their sleeve. Instead of paying for food like the rest of us, they can save money while studying in Canada and go to the food bank to get food for free. Well, for them it's free, but of course, food at a food bank is not free. That food has been donated by Canadians doing something positive for their community. Most likely with the assumption that a homeless Canadian or a disabled Canadian or a Canadian born person who really needs the food is going to be able to rely on the charity of those good Canadians donating the food. I bet you, however, they aren't expecting young 20 year old Indian students to go there, get free food, and then make a video entirely in a different language to send back home talking about how Okay, that's one video. And there are many such videos. Largely, many Indian, Pakistanis, Indians, Bangladeshis going in and surviving basis at food bank. And Canadians are angry. Not just Canadians, even in America, you see this. Let's watch this.
Indian army should come to Canada and storm the temple. Let's look at this one. This is fascinating. Let me hear your thoughts on this also. India confronting Germany in a metro. See, See your German company is supplying us some tunnel boring machines which they make in China. What's the name? But but China is not allowing them to send it to India. Yeah. And some component going from Germany, but most of it is equipment now. See your German company. Observe these videos and let me know. There's another one. This is a little older video, but um, 2019, but we are sensing similar incidents across countries. Open. My friend. I will pay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I will pay. No, no, no. It's no, not about pay. I am very late. It's not about money. Huh? I know you have so a lot of money. I will pay. Huh? I know you have a lot of money. Extra money. I will pay. This is no respect. Now we can prove you stop. Really Why are you yelling just now? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just pleading that we really know about the family. Yelling, yeah? So please, we have to catch up. So we can prove it. See? Okay. After we can prove it all, you now you're yeah. cooling down. Before you yelling you pay, just like hell. You pay it all? Stop so it. Stop it. Yeah. Yeah. This kind of thing. You, you take go. whatever you want to take, then tell. This is now about Bali image. See? Video, video, video. <laughs> video. Explain now. Explain. You explain now. You got I the word. Pay. Okay, stop. Oh stop about paying. Stop it. Video, video, video. Stop it. Open it. Open. My friend. I will pay. Yeah, sorry. sorry. What about paying? Let's see. Let's see this video. Jai Shankar, the most requested podcast. Why do you think that is? <laughs> Probably people are more interested in foreign policy. Uh, nowadays. Nowadays. And you're the poster boy for everything that's happening, correct geopolitically for India. Okay, that's good to know. Right. I think. Right now you're very popular on shorts and reels mm -hmm. for your very aggressive comebacks. You're asking the wrong minister when you say, how long will we do this? Because it is the ministers of Pakistan who will tell you how long Pakistan intends to practice terrorism. I feel like Virat Kohli and yourself are the faces of young India. I'm very nice to people who are nice to me. When I get pushed, I think it's natural to push back. In the last year, year and a half, people have been pushing us a bit. In many ways, your I get pushed is actually when India gets pushed.
ठीक है By the way, if you traveled abroad and if you will travel abroad, you realize there's a lot of anger now against Indians, not just in Canada, in many parts of the world. It's not a surprise that uh, we are not welcomed. Difficult to get the visas also. And it's a matter of fact that our relations are at all time low with many countries, with China, Pakistan, Canada, Bangladesh, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Nepal. Nepal recently issued a new currency note, right? Claiming that some part of India is this. So what's happening? Why is it happening? Of course, we are absolutely wonderful in blaming others. We can blame Maldives, presidents, the ministers, blame Sheikh Asina, we can blame Trudeau, we can blame Afghanistanis, Sri Lankans, the list is endless, we can do all that. But a rational mind will also think, should we look at ourselves also? Something wrong with us. That's, a, that's all rationality is all about. We will just say that, you know, others are jealous of us, that's why. Pravanti, thoughts? Yeah, so I think uh, it, it might be because of the kind of uh, attitude that we get from here, because of the corruptions that we see here. I, and I have seen like some instances, like in Bihar, where even some roads were, you know, disappeared overnight. Financial corruption, it has existed in the past also, and that's one thing. My concern is, is there any moral corruption that's happening? Let me show you another video. This is in Hindi, but let me know your thoughts. We'll translate this in English also. Let's watch this video. Pranab, push जैसे गुरुजी हम रोज पांच हजार राधे राधे नाम जप करते हैं तब पर भी हमको घर पे सब कोई नालायक बोलता है कौन नालायक बोलता है मेरे पापा दीदी बोलते हैं कुछ करते नहीं कुछ काम करते हो नहीं अभी नहीं तो काम भी करो ना बेटा जो काम सोचे हैं वो थोड़ा कठिन है क्या हिंदू राष्ट्र के लिए सभी मूल्यों को मारना चाहते हैं किसको मारना है सभी कटुओं को मूल्य को इसीलिए नाम जप करते हैं गुरु देयर आर लॉफिंग थिंकिंग इट्स नॉर्मल Whatever is happening domestically will reflect it abroad as well. So we have a lot of hate against ourselves. So how is something wrong in terms of how we're conducting a domestic policy or foreign policy? Because this was not always the case. India did not face the kind of hate it's facing now. Or at least Indians. For a long time, India was always celebrated. Not for the power or economy or the market, but for something else. It's cultural appeal. It's culture, it's spirituality, it's yoga, it's Bollywood, rich diversity, India's pluralism. All of that was India's soft power. People used to admire Indian culture, Indian values, Indian heritage. Today, that's not the case. They question it. And why not? Look at them, how they are behaving. Will you allow, you know, that, you know, many people come into your country in India and in Delhi, they raise flags of other country. Shout slogans, request other countries to invade India. Don't allow that. And if anyone does that, what will you think of those people? If you had so much love with our country, why did you go there in Canada? You should have been here.
influence is important soft power is important so anyone heard of this term before soft power soft power is a concept that was introduced by an american scholar joseph nye anyone knows who is joseph nye Joseph Nye, J O S E P H N Y E. How do you remember his name? He defines soft power as the ability of a country to attract and influence others through attraction, not coercion, not by force. Instead of forcing others to agree. Soft power draws people in by showing a way of life, by showing your value system, by showing your culture. That's how they connect. Joseph and I spoke of this in length. We were all attracted to the American soft power. Hollywood, TV shows. Same story has been the case with India also as well. Today it's dissipating. But a few years ago, if you were to go to Eastern Europe, they all would have heard of Raj Kapoor. We'll talk about good Indian food, peaceful Indian people. We'll talk about, you know, how brilliant Indians are, how skilled they are. That is, or that was their exposure to Indians. Soft power. Why is it not called hard power? Why is it called soft power? And how is it different from hard power? Rashri? Sir, uh, hard power is all about using military defense technology to uh, actually influence other nations in international arena. But uh, soft power is somewhat a softer approach through culture, ways of living, etc. Hard power, it relies on force, coercion. Soft power, on the other hand, is more about appeal, attraction. It's like when you see a friend doing something inspiring. You get inspired. You want to follow that example. No one has to tell you or force you to follow them. You're simply drawn to it. Makes sense. Let's think back to India's influence in the past. What were some examples of soft power? Indian movies, Indian shows, they were very popular in Afghanistan. They heard on prime time, influenced in Afghan society. Yoga became popular worldwide. It's a path to mental peace. Ayurveda, Indian cuisine, spices, flavor, it's loved all around the world. Can you think how all of this can appeal the rest of the world towards us? India was seen as land of wisdom, a land of diversity, a land of love, a land of cultural richness, not a land of anger. It created a positive image about India, which is why soft power is very, very valuable to build goodwill. But now looking at those videos we saw, do you think that image still holds? Our WhatsApp messages will tell us, you know, we are remarkable, Vishnu Guru, Naitik Guru, whatnot. People abroad, they are seeing and sensing Indians as aggressive, disrespectful. You have all the money to go to Canada. You have all the money to go to Bali for vacations. But you have no shame in stealing. Be it food, be it accessories. What do you think happens to our soft power when we see these kinds of actions? Whatever goodwill India had developed over decades, all gone down the dust. 
because then it's easier to stereotype others. This is their exposure to Indians. They will start seeing Indians as not a peaceful community, not a culturally rich community, but as problematic, even exploitative. That's the real concern for India's international image. Modi ji signing deals with foreign countries to export laborers, carpenters, plumbers, other unskilled workers, foreign lands. What image do you think it will create for India? Because he's very aggressive on this. Jayashankar ji also very aggressive on this. With Italy to Israel to Germany. That's what they want to export. That's how they want to create jobs. But just think, take a pause. 15 years down the line, 20 years down the line, what image do you think world will have of India? We're exporting unskilled labors. Would this strategy harm India's soft power? Samia? Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I think, yes, it will harm uh, India so far and the overall image also uh, in the coming years because, uh, firstly, with the example of exporting unskilled labor uh, to other parts of the uh, world, it's like showing that our brain power is, uh, uh, has, you know, taken a hit that we will be stereotyped as only, you know, provider of unskilled labor throughout the world. And also if the leadership is being uh, sarcastic and aggressive in, uh, say, such press conferences and meetings, it would also put an image of uh, the government also being very um, not so serious and not so diplomatic. So I think that would show in eventually, and it is also showing a bit now also uh, in the international arena. You will read whatever you saw. It may perhaps make people think that India only produces unskilled workers, not innovators. And why not? They don't travel the world. Their experiences of dealing with Indians would be whosoever come to their town. or whatever they may see on YouTube, and there are videos, how to steal, how to loot. Indian army should come to lands of these countries. Soft power is about building goodwill, projecting a positive image of India's culture, India's values, India's talents. If India's primary export is unskilled labor, it creates a, an image where people see India as a source of low cost labor not a hub for education or technology or culture. If foreign countries mainly interact with Indians who are unskilled in whatever task they do, it will form stereotypes. And that's already happening. India is already being stereotyped as rowdy. In the past few years, it has grown tremendously. Let me show you a few videos. This is Diwali celebrations happening in Canada. And I'll show you of one of London as well. another one. This is from UK.
pods. What do you think, you know, would you want such neighbors? India has spent decades building an image of culturally rich, peaceful, innovative country. And if this perception is replaced by stereotypes about unskilled labor, chips away any goodwill. Countries that once viewed India as a source of cultural richness, skilled talent, they will say it differently. And what do you think will be the impact of those Indian professionals working in high skill jobs abroad? People will assume that they are unskilled. That's how they feel build stereotypes. Soft power is built on respect, admiration. Some may argue that, you know, by sending Indian workers to places like Italy or Israel, government is creating valuable job opportunities. It's a good strategy. Remittances will come. Pakistan also thinks the same. That's how they build their economy. Remittances. Biases are real now against our community, our skin. And it's affecting not just your workers, but also skilled professionals from India who are facing prejudices based on these assumptions. It's damaging India's reputation as a country of professionals like engineers and doctors. People forget easily that they also a land of talent. India built a reputation, skilled talent in the field of engineering, medicine, IT. Not a surprise, you know. From Sankar Pichai to Ajay Panga, they are all heading to the institutions. But over time, what will happen? What message does it send about India or other countries? Germany and Japan, they are seen as powerful and advanced. The skilled labor gave them that respect. When you see a Japanese, you see this, you have this perception. That person will be hardworking. I've not met many Japanese, but that's the perception. Who you export, immigration policy, immigration policy, it enhances country's reputation. It's your diplomacy. In today's interconnected world, soft power, an extremely, extremely critical tool. Countries that are attractive, they're more likely to build positive relations and partnerships. And they will also see easy visa policies. South Korea's K-pop, Japan's anime technology. So what are the main sources of soft power? What could be those sources? So Joseph and I would say that, you know, soft power focuses has three aspects to it. Number one, foreign policy. What's your foreign policy like? Number two, culture. Number three, political values. Culture is when, you know, which gets admired. What kind of values? You said. The foreign policy is also important. Something that is seen fair, supportive of global peace. We just watched a video of an Indian minister publicly scolding, misbehaving with a German minister for reels. Recording it, sharing and showing India's strength. And of course, many in the comment section will support ministers move. See, this is how India is getting very strong. There's another video of our foreign minister roasting representatives from other countries, showing India's assertiveness. What do you think is the goal behind these videos? The goal is simple. They want to show to, to the domestic audience how strong we are. Which is good. 
but show this show all that in action not on reels you're not influencers you're not youtubers you're ministers the question is what cost you are creating those reels when you create such confrontational videos will that german minister be impressed with you when he or she goes back to germany it will make you look arrogant they will see that you are disrespectful you are aggressive unnecessarily why because you want to create reels you're creating an image of india's hostility arrogance that's not how you deal in diplomacy have some closed door meetings sort out things when a minister publicly scold a german minister it doesn't reflect well on india's diplomacy it is giving a clear impression that minister at that time he wants to just go viral want to flex the power that see look at us what do you think will do will do what do you think will happen to a software in this case it's weakened soft power is built on cultural respect cooperation goodwill and diplomats ministers when they prioritize social media stunts or thoughtful diplomacy thoughtful diplomacy it chips away any positive image that india has created over the years if these videos go back you know go viral in canada us mexico germany how will their people react this is how you treated a minister and don't it similar happening across our neighbors with our neighbors bangladeshis people in bangladesh they don't think highly of india now in afghanistan same story in pakistan of course that's the story sri lanka myanmar canada across the world whatever we are seeing today is pride domestically it is aggression it's disrespect a diplomacy is built on mutual respect cooperation but here it's not built on that it's built on viral videos nepal historically had good ties with india but now look at them the currency notes what's happening to your reels the reels can not stop it they become resentful of india same story with bangladesh foreign policy is not just about russia and israel beyond that the protests the aggression misuse of resources conflicts all of that can harm india's reputation abroad it's already harming them, harming it instead of seeing india as a cultural and peaceful leader seeing india as a hostile disrespectful leader and it's weakening the very foundations of soft power joseph nice concept of soft power emphasizes the ability of countries to attract others through culture political values are the inclusive our foreign policy india has had a rich history of soft power it looks like things are changing please write down one question but before this you know before you write down on the question any thoughts on whatever whatever you discussed Pravanti. so whatever you have mentioned right sir i i personally see this happening already at least in us so few of my friends whoever are already there doing part times they are being looked down wherever you see like indians are uh, you know taking away all their jobs working in you know all the lowly paid jobs so this is already happening 
And I'm astonished, you know, foreign minister.